Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Brian Miller. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. CME Group, Trading Technologies, FTSE Russell, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for Futures Traders, be sure to click on their logos on futuresradioshow.com. Today I spoke with managing partner and head quantitative strategist at Optimize Your Trading, Brian Miller. Brian discusses his journey from being an inventor to a quantitative trader, shares his process for developing a quantitative strategy, monitoring his strategies and determining if they're in a drawdown or if it's back to the drawing board, and last but not least, Brian shares with us how a trade would set up on one of his quantitative strategies. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Brian. Brian, how'd you get involved in trading futures? Yeah, that's a long story. So um, in 2008, um, I invented, in, or actually in 2005, I invented a uh, product for the mining industry and started a small manufacturing business. Um, and, and grew that to size and, and end up exiting that business. And that perfectly coincided with uh, 2008, which actually was, you know, as, as we all know, a very interesting time to, to start trading within the market. Um, and then uh, started just dis uh, discretionary trading, uh, and then slowly uh, started being introduced to systematic trading in around 2010. I'm curious, what did you invent? <laughs> uh, it's uh, called fly rails. It was uh, it's a product for underground mining. It's a reusable way to hang your your fly pads and and curtain to keep the air in the uh, upper sections where the coal is actually being mined. So it um, it reduces uh, cost and increases productivity from uh, a certain machine operator called a roof bolter. And you go from that to trading futures. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That yeah, that's that's definitely a leap, but. Um, it was, it, it was a good time. It was, it was fun. So, you know, actually that, you know, uh, I, I think that that was really, uh, the, the optimal time to learn because you're facing a lot of adversity right off the bat. So anything that you, uh, any environment that you're within, uh, afterwards is, you know, kind of like walking down easy street. What is your style of trading? Uh, style I, under you know, underlying strategic concepts are, are really reverting in nature. Uh, obviously, we want to measure, you know, directional biases, um, you know, directional probabilities and uh, long-term growth potential, fundamentals, behavioral justifications, et cetera. Uh, but the underlying, you know, order statement logic within our concepts are reverting. We want to seek value um, and we want to exploit value uh, on, you know, multiple frequencies or, uh, to diversify the factors that produce outcome. How did you go from inventing something to, to even understanding this type of trading strategies? A, a, a time, <laughs> the 10,000 the 10, the 10, hour rule or, you know, trial and error. Uh, I had, uh, you know, a couple of very valuable mentors in my life. Um, one with, kind of within the world of trading uh, and then one within the world of programming. And I, I kind of stumbled upon them both. I was very lucky, uh, you know, to have uh, two people that, that allocated their time and their experience uh, to help me along. And, you know, I'll always be forever uh, grateful for them for that opportunity to, to learn from 
you know, two people that I, I still respect to this day. And, uh, you know, I, I think that honestly, that's when you, when you get into a position, uh, you know, uh, that success has found you, that's, it's probably one of the best gifts that you can offer back is to offer a mentorship to someone. So you learned about this style of trading through a mentor. Yeah, well, I, I would say, uh, you know, it, it, it's really stemmed from starting with discretionary trading and learning different setups, right? And then once the programming came into play and systematic trading came into play, it was about taking that philosophy of applying different setups um, into a single systematic concept so that you know you can your outcome isn't dependent on a single market environment a single condition or substructure a single setup uh, and so that in turn improves time return ratio so it evolved correct yeah it's very very methodically uh, you know a, a lot of it honestly was just you know i <laughs> I love what I do. And it, when you really genuinely love what you do, uh, it, not, nothing really feels like work. You're, you're, you're more apt to, to learn more quickly. And, you know, again, you know, 80, 100 hours a week really just, you know, it, it, it was pretty easy. It didn't feel like work at, at any point in time. And so uh, interesting, too. I mean, when you're trying to, to solve a problem that's in a constant state of uh, evolution, right? Uh, you know, you can get into some really creative ideas and, you know, mathematics is mathematics. The data is the data. Everyone pretty much has access to the same, you know, underlying concepts or, um, you know, algorithms or analytic methods. But, you know, the, 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 the differentiating factor is, you know, usually, I mean, it's kind of generic, but it's creativity and perspective and how you choose to constantly push yourself to view the market from a different perspective. It could be something as simple and as trivial as, you know, the, the, the generic momentum function, right? That every platform, every trading platform offers a momentum function that's, you know, value minus value divided by, you know, the look back period, right? So, you know, in, instead of, you know, looking at generic momentum, you know, split it up into directional strength, right? So measure directional momentum. Um, and so, you know, it's just small things. Uh, like that, that can make a difference. How many strategies do you have? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, that I've developed or that, that we currently have, that we currently offer. How many strategies are, are you currently running? Okay. So uh, we have uh, ES, uh, an ES strategy, um, uh, gold, NASDAQ, Russell, uh, uh, spy. Uh, we also have uh, micro futures. So we primarily focus on linearly biased markets that's fundamentally and behaviorally justified. So we design concepts for, uh, you know, large cap blue chip stocks, like index smart beta ETFs, uh, and then index bond crude gold futures. Are all of those strategies customized to each market or is it the same strategy that's run across all of those markets? Oh, they're absolutely customized to each market. Every market has their own set of characteristics, so even though that obviously certain indexes are, are, are going to be correlated, but um, you know, each market has its own set of specific characteristics or behaviors, especially in different environments. So uh, even though the underlying strategic philosophy might be the same, um, you know, we tune everything to, uh, you know, to different markets uh, and different frequencies. So, you know, for instance, some markets have, you know, more reverting characteristics than others or mo momentum characteristics, for instance, like the, you know, the S&P, you know, has more reverting characteristics than the NASDAQ. And that's kind of fundamentally justified as well. You know, the NASDAQ is, you know, made up more of a, of a single type of sector, whereas the S&P is made up of stocks from a bunch of different sectors. So that diverse, that diversification uh, increases reverting characteristics. All right, well, let's pick one of those markets and mm -hmm. talk to us about the development of the strategy all the way to the point to where you've decided it was a green light ready to trade. Right. Well, with us, it, it, everything begins with the data, right? Uh, we don't start with a strategic concept. In fact, I believe that's uh, you know, one of the biggest mistakes 
that you can make as a developer or strategist is starting with a concept and then trying to force it to work you know, on a certain market. So we want to match a strategic concept or we want to match uh, the, the underlying concepts that we already know that work with the characteristics of the market. And then how do we mitigate the risks of those concepts along with uh, you know, improving outcome consistency uh, to ensure that outcome isn't dependent on a perspective of singularity. And so once we, uh, once we derive the optimal strategic concepts uh, for certain environments, again, everything reverts back to the data, the behavior characteristics of the market, whether it's reverting or trending, um, as well as you know, the cyclical movements and the types of value, the payoff matrix of certain conditions, the correlations of different setups or different models or sources of alpha, so to speak. Um, and then we wrap those within a single systematic structure. Um, and, you know, obviously some models, for instance, let's say you have a market environment 10B, right? And then you have uh, you know, a market classification 10C. So historically speaking, 10B can be performing uh, very well for a certain amount of time. However, historically speaking, that condition, you know, 10C uh, may, uh, you can switch, have a positive switching mechanism to where you can switch or identify that, uh, you know, 10B may, uh, may be losing its synchronization or correlation uh, to, you know, the current characteristics that's being exuded within the market to the source of alpha. So you, you basically, you know, can identify predictive ways to switch from different sources of alpha. And once we include uh, and then draw upon the, the correlations within, uh, you know, the different sources of alpha or different trading setups that we include. Uh, then we wrap those within, uh, you know, an intelligent uh, money management system or, or a control module, uh, which also uh, basically attracts uh, every model's performance as if they was all trading live. And then it also tracks uh, performance efficiencies, you know, entry and exit efficiencies to see you know, how trades could been improved from the initial underlying strategic concept or order statement logic. Um, and then it loops those back in to create a constant uh, layer of, or, or a constant pressure, I could say, of improvement. So the system is kind of in a constant state of learning, so to speak, without really uh, negating the underlying strategic concept. We, we don't apply uh, machine learning here, you know, you know, like some other firms. So, you know, risk, it can sometimes be very difficult to identify uh, strategic risk that is uh, whenever you're using machine learning to actually source alpha. And the reason why that is, is sometimes, obviously, we, you know, we don't know the reason why machine learning can choose certain types of alpha. Uh, however, we design the underlying sources of alpha ourselves uh, or the underlying strategic concepts. And then, however, you know, we implement more machine learning structures within you know, the systematic structure side of things. So, uh, you know, underlying, you know, creatively simple strategic concepts. However, we exploit complexity, you know, more on the systematic structure side of things. And then once we, once we design something, um, you know, we make constant improvements, um, then we'll, we'll simulate it. Uh, we'll run it out of sample on live data for a certain amount of time uh, to ensure obviously there's no, there's no issues with, with trade mismatches or anything like that. Um, and then we'll offer it publicly after, you know, two or three months at least of out of sample data. I have a lot of questions. How long <laughs> does the development process typically take? Uh, anywhere from six to nine months, typically per product. Okay. Uh, um, are these high frequency, low frequency? Talk to us about how often they're trading, things like that. Yeah, no. So, you know, when, when, my business partner and I started optimized trading. We realized that HFT or MFT was not not a business that we could easily get into. So we primarily focus on you know short term short term swing to uh, you know holding periods anywhere from you know forty five minutes to an hour all the way up to maybe a week. And that's consistent through all the markets, uh, all the strategies. Yeah. Yes. Pretty, pretty much, except, you know, with an exception with, with some of our stock concepts, yes, pretty much, because you can exploit multiple frequencies within a, you know, a single asset there. But 
for the most part, our futures products, yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a single frequency, however we, or a single um, time frame. However, we we exploit multiple variations of value, and that's really how we differentiate our concepts as well. From you know whether it's cyclical or random. Are you watching these strategies manually every single day, just monitoring them? How are you deciding when to turn them off? Are they ever? Uh, if you are ever deciding to turn them off, and also, is there times where they get more aggressive or less aggressive with position sizing? Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, yeah, we monitor uh, all the products that that we offer publicly. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we do that for multiple reasons. Um, but and then the other thing too that I would say is we we you know as as price data continues to evolve. You know, we want to go back, even if a product is performing well, we still want to go in and to see what improvements could have been made, you know, as a new market environment, as a new data set becomes available, a new condition occurs, or maybe a new market event that that occurred, maybe it didn't really impact performance, maybe it did. Either way, we want to go implement that within the data set to see, you know, how did that change things? Should we tweak, uh, make some small adjustments? However, you know, throughout that process, you know, in our constant state of improvement, you know, the underlying strategic concepts are the same. Um, and the other question regarding position sizing, actually, money management, you know, the way that we really perceive, a, you know, a, a complete systematic product, the entry and exit logic, uh, kind of, you know, it's really just the, the engine, right, of, of the vehicle. Um, the, the money management Especially when you're not, con you know, restricted uh, or as restricted on the number of contracts uh, that you have to deploy. Um, so it really opens up the doors to create proprietary data sets um, and to apply, you know, a multi-layered you know, uh, intellect within the system uh, for self-analysis, self-improvement, uh, you know, efficiency analysis. Um, and to really exploit the probabilities of certain uh, out, uh, sources of alpha, different probabilities of, of all the different models that you've had included. For instance, you know, if, if for instance, if, you're, if your max contract is 10, um, you know, you could use a percentage based off of one, what type of value it is, random or cyclic. Random variations value will always be of uh, higher risk. So that those will always deploy a slightly lower uh, percentage um, and, or cyclical, and then allow multiple entries, and that also diversifies uh, outcome, obviously. But money management is a great opportunity to really add a lot of layers of intellect within the system, and to and to further improve upon, you know, what the underlying strategic concepts offer, and or mitigate the risks of those concepts further. So, so that's really how we really you know focus on money management. It's a, it's, it's a minimal part of what we do here, uh, you know, especially with markets to, to where we, we can deploy, you know, multi-contracts and multi-entry. Hey everybody, I wanna take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, FTSE Russell. They are a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. The Russell 2000 Index is a key benchmark for small cap US stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 Index futures Contract symbol RTY. For more information on FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. I want to stay on money management here just for a moment. And I want to talk about the difference between a drawdown, you identifying a drawdown versus pulling the system temporarily and tweaking it or, or basically saying, you know what, maybe this strategy just isn't working anymore. How, how do you identify the difference between the two? Well, it, you know, some of that can start within the development process. Um, you know, if you are you know, designing specific sources of alpha, you know, sometimes even with, you know, very realistic uh, stop logic, sometimes they, they won't get hit historically. So that actually gives you a fundamental justification for, 
deploying a stop level and that lot and that stop level being hit so then you know that there's something wrong there with that model like it's out of bounds you know it's deviated from how it's reacted to the market uh historically so you know obviously you're going to hit stops you're going to have losing positions uh the difference between something you know occurring once um you know, as long as it's not repetitive in nature and, and sustaining, you know, through a certain amount of time. Typically, you know, we want to look for trending factors. Obviously, you're going to go through periods of increased growth or, or lag. But the, the really good thing about, you know, multi models and multi sources of alpha is typically the trade frequency is pretty good. So the more something trades, uh, the more quickly you can identify changes in its behavior couple of questions before we get into rapid fire. Um, the first one is, I know this is probably going to be a tough one because I know that there's a lot that goes in behind the scenes with your strategy determining whether or not to get into a trade. But can you share with us a trade setup example as to what your strategy is seeing to where it says, okay, that's it. We're getting in. Right. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's very dynamic in nature and it's, it's very dependent upon the, you know, the current market environment condition and substructure, uh, which, uh, models are, are currently activated or which, uh, characteristics that the market exuding is exuding is in line with, with certain concepts. So for instance, for a, a random variation of value, first, the money manager is going to identify the, the, the number of shares that we're going to allocate to that position. And then, you know, we're going to look for, you know, multiple frequencies of momentum where we are in the current and in, in the current cycle to ensure that we're not overbought, obviously. And then we're going to use a, a, a weight and ratio uh, to determine uh, our random type of value, which is usually a combination between uh, volume interest and then the highest low of the past three to five days minus a certain calculation. So usually it involves, you know, an average, uh, the current cycle historically of open minus low plus, you know, abs value of linear slope. So we take a percentage of that historically minus from, you know, and the, the, the uh, type of value of the calculation that we use is really relegated to, um, you know, the different market environments and substructures, uh, such as market classification. So we break things down into 32 uh, MCs, which is just market classification methods. And then it, it, that really determines the underlying order statement logic that we apply. So the the market or the systematic structure really says, OK, you have a strategic concept and that's kind of sits on top, if you will. And then below that, then we identify very, you know, specifically, um, you know, market classification, and each classification deploys a, a very specific entry target, and each entry target uh, comes with its own set of exit logic. So, um, you know, number two may may be seeking ten points, uh, whereas number twenty four may be seeking twenty two or twenty three. So everything is dynamic. Everything is. Uh, relevant to uh, something that's uh, within that environment, within that model, within that substructure. So we don't apply anything set in nature. Everything is relative to what the market is exuding and then what uh, may be to come. So a lot of times you can find predictive patterns and with market classifications like market classification one occurs, then uh, you know if it occurs for a certain amount of time or a certain amount of distance, et cetera, then you have, you know, an X probability that market classification four may may occur, right? So, and then that gives you a predictive um, means to uh, apply a heavier weight to uh, the the models that are designed for condition four. Very interesting stuff. Thank you for sharing that with us. Last question before we get into rapid fire. We talked about your backstory and how you went from inventing something to getting into quantitative trading, systematic trading, right? What would be the first step that you would recommend to a trader out there that is interested in getting involved in quantitative trading? Yeah, that's a good question. I, first and foremost, you have to be open-minded. 
uh, and, and don't follow don't follow the herd. You know, don't follow the traditionalist uh, rules or or structures when it comes to systematic design. You know, follow the data. Um, don't go into it with your with preconceived notions of what may or may not work. Just allow the data to really mold the concept for you, um, and then don't be afraid to to do something different. Great stuff, but we are not done yet. We have rapid fire questions next, Brian, if you're ready for those. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Our, our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trade the global markets with TT, the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. You can try it now for free at tryttnow.com. Brian, first question for you. What trader has influenced your life the most and why? Uh, it, it wasn't a specific trader. Uh, it was, again, I had two uh, very important mentors in my life, one with trading and then one with uh, in, in the world of programming. But then in addition to that, you know, I, I would really look at you know, how other firms uh, have or other concepts have failed historically. Uh, you know, long-term capital management or a continued decline of, of the correlation or synchronization of trend following concepts. So really, you know, looking at how others uh, fail can teach you lessons very quickly. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in quantitative trading? Systematically speaking, it was learning that not every nut or bolt uh, included within a systematic structure or strategic concept uh, has to be fundamentally or behaviorally justified, but that the the piece or the structure that it holds together uh, in and of itself may may be uh, a justification. And so it, it's kind of like you know looking at at a painting close up. You may just see small little dots, but when you zoom out, you know you view a masterpiece. How has your quantitative trading process evolved over the years? Oh, uh, wow. Uh, learn how to effectively uh, differentiate and exploit uh, the differences between simplicity and complexity. Um, you know, keeping the underlying strategic concepts, you know, creatively simple, especially aligned with uh, you know, John Conway's works on rules and complexities, uh, and then knowing how to introduce complexity without, while still being able to identify the underlying risks of the, the product applied. What is one attribute that you believe every quantitative trader should have? Uh, again, I, I really revert back to just being open-minded and, um, you know, allowing the data to, to guide you within your process. Favorite book about trading? <laughs> That's one thing that, you know, I never I never really pursued, uh, you know, books from successful traders, and primarily because, you know, markets, markets, you know, changed pretty suddenly in the late 90s, the characteristics, and I really don't foresee them going back to how they were. So concepts that may have worked for some trader a while back, uh, you know, they may not work now. So instead, you know, I, I you know, I pursued you know, behavioral finance, uh, you know, advances in behavioral finance or misbehaving or game theory, uh, so gaming the market uh, for one or game theory for applied economics. So those are those are things or philosophy. Those are the things that really I pursued uh, to expand my knowledge on uh, instead of trying to learn a, a certain method that was deployed and worked well for a certain amount of time for a certain individual. If you had to pick a profession other than trading, what would it be? Uh, the psychiatry. What's the best piece of advice you received about trading? To pursue consistency above return. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, wow. So I would definitely teach myself how to, um, to ensure and exploit, uh, you know, uh, outcome to, to ensure that it's diversified, to be able to design, uh, you know, multi-alpha source uh, systematic structures that would probably be uh, high on my list. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge in quantitative trading, what would you say? You know, we take the cap M philosophy, you know, light years of head, uh, ahead of traditional methods. Uh, thus returns can be achieved, you know, with a lower risk profile 
uh, and more consistently. Um, and so uh, really, in, in essence, the, 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 the structures that we deploy is focus primarily on consistency and risk mitigation. You know, so, um, you know, I, I think long term success uh, is really uh, attributed to, uh, uh, you know, trying to obtain longevity in that space. Last question for today. Favorite thing to do when you're not trading? Oh, I have two wonderful kids. I have a daughter, Evie, that's four, and a son, Jude, that's uh, going to turn two in a, you know, about five months or so. And then I also have a 115-pound Weimaraner that loves chasing squirrels, so he takes a lot, of, a lot of spare time. Nice. Where could people find you on social media and give us a website to check out? Absolutely. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn and uh, uh, OptimizeTrading.com or OptimizeYourTrading.com. Brian, this was awesome. Thank you so much for joining me on Futures Radio Show today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit FuturesRadioShow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.